All right, we're going to move now into the second session uh, of our lesson, which is dealing with personal Bible study. And actually, this uh, is lesson number nine, feeding on the Word or our daily bread. So we'll talk about what the importance of the Word is in our lives. The Word of God is a food that gives us life and sustenance as believers. <clears throat> Jesus indicated that the Word of God was the source of life to him. In Matthew 4.4, 4, um, he says, uh, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I like to say that we need a fresh proceeding word, a word coming forth from the mouth of God each and every day of our lives, amen, to sustain us and keep us our best spiritually. Jesus encourages us to labor for and to feed on the right kinds of food in John 6, through 27. Uh, he says, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Um, so Jesus was speaking of a bread that when you eat it, you would never hunger again. John 6.35 says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. <clears throat> And then, uh, number two in John 4, 13 through, through uh, 14, he refers to the water that you shall drink and you, call, and you shall never thirst. So it says, And Jesus said unto her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Um, so uh, the, the, the responsibility of hunger and thirst uh, is really on us. And uh, we have to choose to eat and to drink, uh, you know, the right things. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, Isaiah 55, 1 and 2 says, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does not that does you no good? Listen, and I will tell you where to get food that is good for the soul. So that's Isaiah, amen. So it's important um, <clears throat> for us to get a word from the Lord on a daily basis. Uh, Jesus indicated in Matthew 6, 11, we talked about this particular model of prayer, that we were to pray every day. Give us this day our daily bread. God has a word that is proceeding out of his mouth for us. Uh, and he's speaking to us at all times. And there is a word that is proceeding out of his mouth for you and for me. Amen. Responding to this word is the thing that will keep us alive. Uh, he has a present truth or a now word for us. Second Peter 1.12 says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things though you know and are established in the truth. So God has a word for us um, that is designed to fit into the specific context of our life. In the present sense, he wants us to have, have present tense experiences for him. In other words, we don't eat old manna, yesterday's manna. Um, technically, yesterday's manna is also referred to as dung, and so it's not healthy for us to eat that. God has a word for us today. Um, Hebrews 3.15 says today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. <clears throat> so God has a word for us today. The word is consistent with our present development and growth level as we walk forward into the purposes of our lives. God's method of building is line upon line, precept upon precept, and little by little. So uh, <coughs> he'll be faithful to give us the meat that we need in due season. Amen. So what are some of the things that we need to do if we are to receive the proper food? We need to understand the place and the power of God's Word. Um, and we also need to understand God's attitude about His Word. Uh, and that is that He, number one, He magnifies it above His name. That's pretty strong. Meditate on that. His Word is alive, 
powerful and active, and is sharp. His word does not return void. He backs up his word with signs following. Uh, there's an eightfold ministry of the word in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. The word, the scripture says, is good for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, convincing, rebuke, exhortation, and comfort. So the word is powerful. Amen. Uh, we need to have a proper attitude toward the word of God. Uh, we need to have the attitude of hungering for and desiring the word, uh, that of being teachable uh, before the word. We need to have an attitude of humility before the word. We need to have an attitude of obedience or personal application of the word. We also need to, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, uh, excuse me, this, it means learning the right way to study the Bible. It means learning how to use the best tools for digging. Uh, it means accumulating helpful resources, studying and doing the work yourself, battling the natural spirit of laziness, uh, it means overcoming the natural weariness of much study. It means having a designated place for private study. And uh, it means having a set time to study. Um, so you can read the scriptures that go along with these to support them. How is the word of God like manna for God's people? Well, Jesus ties the preceding word uh, into the manna of old. Uh, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you. To know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger <clears throat> and, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Tell me if or when you need coffee. I'm fine. I'm, I, I hope we'll be done in about an hour. And so we see in Exodus chapter 16, uh, also reference to this same, uh, you know, uh, mentioning here, uh, the word of God proceeding from the, uh, from the mouth of God. Um, we want to understand that it was uh, bread from heaven, and the word of God is God's special gift to us. Uh, it's miracle bread. In other words, when you consider the process by which the word of God has come to us, it is definitely a miracle, isn't it? Uh, amen. So uh, it is the bread that God had given them to eat in Exodus 16, 15. And so the word of God is the food that God has given us to sustain our lives in this day and age. Uh, it came to where the people were and uh, it was it was accessible. God always sees that his word can be attained and that his people can be fed. And he's a good God in that sense. Uh, Exodus 16, 14, it was a small round uh, type of substance and uh, relating that over natural speaking the word of the Lord is a small thing it's not impressive to the natural man uh, but it was round and so the word of the Lord is round in the sense that it has no rough angles or edges and it's perfectly whole and it's eternal amen it was white which speaks of its purity and righteousness it was to be eaten <clears throat> uh, as a matter of fact it was to be all eaten and uh, it tasted like fresh oil, therefore meaning or implying that it's uh, the Word of God works together with the Spirit of God. Tasted like honey, so the Word of God is sweet always to the hungry soul. Amen. Um, the Word uh, will keep you healthy. Uh, it's fine and easy to digest. It was to be gathered daily, so you need fresh, fresh manna every day. Came early with the dew. Amen. Uh, it was gathered in the morning. It was gathered by labor. It takes a certain amount of work to gather a word from the Lord. Amen. And uh, it's gathered by stooping. So we have to humble ourselves. We have to put ourselves in the right position in order to partake of the word of the Lord. Amen. Uh, it was always enough. And so whether you read a little or you read a lot, it's always going to satisfy and provide power to your soul. Amen. Uh, it met each one's need. Uh, so the Word of God ministers to each person personally and specifically. Amen. 
It couldn't be stored for another day. So every day God gives you just enough for that day and expects you to work hard to get that word again tomorrow. Uh, it tested their obedience daily. Every day they had to rise up and gather. And each day they had to choose for obedience um, if they were going to be fed. Like it, uh, uh, it was that which kept was kept in the ark that endured forever. And the word that we hide in the ark of our heart will remain and sustain us. Uh, forever it was eaten throughout <coughs> pardon me it was eaten throughout the wilderness wanderings <coughs> and uh, so um, as long as we're living on this planet we need the heavenly man and when we get to heaven uh, the need for it will cease and so it's absolutely essential for your for you now spiritually speaking amen uh, but sa sadly oftentimes uh, <coughs> it was despised by God's people and uh, so we want to be sure that we don't fall into that bad category. Now, in lesson number 10, we're talking about reading the Bible. So what are the first steps to Bible reading and study? Uh, first thing we have to do is see the need for it. Amen. We must see the need for it. In our class, we discuss the importance of feeding on the Word of God. Now we're going to talk about the importance of reading and studying and in how we feed ourselves. We must believe that we will not prosper without it. We must believe that our survival depends upon it. We must believe that we will 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 absolutely die without it. So when you actually start to believe something, it changes the way that you live your life. And so we want to be sure that we're making a personal commitment to the Word of God and that we're choosing a translation of the Bible for, for it. Um, <clears throat> every person will have a translation of the Bible that will serve them in the area of personal Bible study. And you can choose many different translations of the Bible for your personal devotional enrichment, but it's good to choose one for the more systematic study. Uh, you should choose one that is both readable and that is accurate. And then you want to adopt a plan for it. Uh, we fail to plan, then we plan to fail, basically is what happens. Uh, you want to establish a regular study time in the Word of God when you're going to meet with God and you're going to hear from God through His Word. Amen. And so that is important. Uh, you want to keep the schedule that you have established and then you want to be sure that you are willing to invest in it. And this means willing to spend money on Bible, your Bible reading habit, uh, to spend time to spend some uh, effort in studying, digging in, and researching. So how do we choose a translation of the Bible <clears throat> uh, for ourselves? And so there are many versions and many translations of the Bible to choose from. And uh, for, as far as devotional reading, almost any version will do for devotional reading. But there are two types of versions that are inspirational when you are reading for personal devotions. And they are paraphrases and then thought for thought translations. An example of a paraphrase would be the Living Bible, uh, the Message, or the Phillips Translation, which attempts to understand the meaning of the passage and put it into the context of the modern world. Uh, many paraphrases are not based on the original Greek text, but are based on the reading of other contemporary versions. So you've got a step pattern going on there. And it, it, there is a tendency to lose some of the richness and some of the intent that was meant in the Scripture. Thought for Thought Translations. A Thought for Thought Translation, for example, would be like the NIV. Uh, it's usually based on the original languages, but is not so concerned about a word-for-word -word translation of the Greek. And so the translators attempted to understand the Greek mind and translate the thought that, uh, <clears throat> or the concept into the contemporary mind or the contemporary mind's understanding. So, um, but for deeper study, you, you, usually it's better to use a more literal translation of the Bible. Uh, because your deeper study involves digging into the uh, actual Greek words and concepts, and it's more rewarding to work from a text that will be true to the actual word equivalence. And then for uh, cautious usage, there are some translations that, you sh that should be avoided or used with extreme caution. Some translations take extreme liberty with the text of the Bible. Usually, translators in this category have an agenda other than understanding the clear meaning of the original text, and often they attempt to bring modern culture uh, with this modern system of values into the inspired Word of God. The New Revised Standard Version is one of those versions. 
that seeks to make the text of the scripture gender neutral and to the extent of referring to God as both uh, father and mother. So that's, you know, that's, you don't want that. That's nonsense. Uh, part of researching and translating is being aware <coughs> of who is doing the work of translating. Bible translation work is not an exact science. Often there are choices to be made in choosing words to go from one language to another, and the bias of the translator can enter in at this point. This is why it's important to remember that the only truly inspired text are the original documents of the original language text in which the Bible was actually written. So what are some common Bible reading plans that you might consider? Well, uh, there are many ways to approach the study of God's Word. You can read the Bible straight through um, if you want to. You can uh, read through from Genesis to uh, Revelation. Uh, you can alternate Old Testament and New Testament reading. You can actually buy a, a one-year Bible that will help you with this. Or you can read a portion of the Old and a portion of the New and a chapter in Proverbs and a chapter in Psalms. Uh, there's various ways you can do it if you want to set a goal of reading the Bible through in a year, which is very healthy. Uh, reading the Bible chronology uh, uh, in order. Uh, most people understand that the books of the Bible, uh, as we find them, are not in chronological order. They are arranged by category. Uh, and so um, Bible reading plans based on chronology are available, or you can actually purchase the chronological Bible that is already arranged that way. And you can even get things off of the internet that will tell you what books to read in what order and things of that nature. Then we can read the Bible topically. This, uh, this is not a real common way to read through the Bible. It's a little more difficult because you, you begin to you know, lose track of what you've read and where you've been, but you can do it. Uh, and then there are Bible studies that focus on themes. Uh, those who have crafted these Bibles uh, <clears throat> do so with the idea of emphasizing a specific aspect of the Word of God. Some examples would be the Spirit-Filled Life Bible or the Application Bible or perhaps the Maxwell Leadership Bible or the Christian Counselor's New Testament by J. Adams. These are all good Bibles to have on hand if you want to focus in an area and specifically, you know, uh, glean more in that particular theme, then that'll be helpful. So what are the primary ways to interact with the Bible? The Bible seems like a very large book, but when you consider that it's only a book that the Christian must master in his entire lifetime, it's the only one. You don't have a whole uh, wall of books. Uh, really, this is the book. It's the one that has life in it. Amen. Um, in addition to memorization and meditation that we touched earlier, believers should adopt the following ways of interpreting, uh, interacting with the Word of God so that they can grow in their knowledge of the Word throughout their lifetime. Uh, they should read it devotionally. Uh, they should also take time to study each book of the Bible in depth. And then they should study it topically. In other words, we should know the Bible uh, in its context and its stories, but we should also be able to pull from the Bible uh, in relation to those contexts, that context and those stories. The, we should be able to pull from the Bible uh, specific topics and issues so that we can address them in our life and help others with those. You'll find uh, <clears throat> a Bible translator or versions chart that can be very helpful and beneficial for you and just allow you to read through that yourself. It's self-explanatory and it'll give you a little bit of a more understanding on the differences between them. Uh, let's go to lesson number 11, Bridging the Gap. Uh, what's the most significant challenge when it comes to studying the Bible? And that would be to fully understand the Bible uh, <clears throat> is bridging the communication gap that exists between the context in which the Bible was written and our present day context. The truth of what was being communicated by God is in a very real sense locked up in the actual biblical context. In order to fully understand the Bible we must bridge four primary gaps. This is a very important lesson right here and I want to encourage you because what we're really dealing with is very light light surface scratch of hermeneutics. And so um, this will help you in your personal Bible study. And then if you find an interest in this, or if you're going to go on in ministry and get a degree, you need to take the course hermeneutics um, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and you know, learn some more about that. But anyway, the language gap. So the Bible was written in languages, uh, which for the most part are not understood by those of us who read the Bible today. The primary language of the Bible is Hebrew and Greek, with some portions having been 
originally written in any ancient uh, Chaldean or Aramaic. Even for those who speak some of the languages, uh, there's a problem because the ancient languages have changed over time and uh, some of these languages, are, you know, they're just, it's not the same anymore actually and it involves, uh, it, it evolves over time like, like the English language does. And so uh, if we're to understand the Bible in its context, we need to know some things relative to the languages in which the Bible was written. We need to know what the words meant when they were written down by the author. We also need to know the idiomatic expressions and figures of speech that are used in the Bible and what their contemporary equivalents would be today. So we get a proper transition from then to now and don't lose the content of the meaning. Uh, we need to know the origin, formation, and history of the words. We call that today etymology. Um, and uh, so uh, these are important things. We need to know the significance of different grammatical constructions as to how they have a bearing uh, on the meaning of the text. This is very important, uh, these things. We need to understand the literary style, whether it be poetic, historical, prophetic, apocalyptic, uh, or, or whatever, uh, in which the passage is written to better understand it in our day as well. Then we have, number two, a cultural gap that we've got to deal with. In addition to the language gap, there's this gap. Uh, the Bible was written in the context of an Eastern and agrarian culture that is not consistent with the culture of most of those reading the Bible today. Much of the culture of the Bible is built around farming, sheep herding, and systems of bartering. Many of the cultural practices of the people in the Bible are, part of, are not a part of the modern culture today. Uh, so even the actual authors who wrote over many centuries did not share the exact same culture in the Bible. So you can even see some changes over time, uh, even in the writing of the Bible. And the, cult the culture of Daniel is much different from the culture of Amos, for example. So God is not interested in the duplication of biblical culture, uh, per se, but he is interested in the principles by which the culture operated. In order to understand the principle behind the practice, we have to understand some things that relate to that. Number one, we must understand what the culture of the day was and how it has a bearing on the passage in this question. And to get this information, you're going to have to do some digging. Amen? We must understand, number two, the material elements of culture, including such things as transportation, cooking, clothing, tools, farming, uh, weapons of warfare, housing, animal life, taxation, balances, scales, weights, measures, Raising of sheep, how big or how little was, a, was uh, the woman's offering, how valuable is a sparrow, how expensive was the, the uh, bonfire that was built by the confessing, those confessing their deeds, <clears throat> how much manna was gathered and placed in the ark at the cone. In other words, it, it, it's a plethora of things, a plethora of things that we, you're going to need to understand, but you're only going to relate and understand them as you go along and you come across them, you research them to help fulfill, fill in and to help round out your understanding so you can bring it over into today's culture and get the intended meaning and not have it uh, misstrewed. Uh, we have to understand the social order of a society in which the verses were written, including things like marriage customs, biblical trades, uh, economics, legal requirements, civil laws, and other social customs like that. We would consider things like what is betrothal, uh, smelting, uh, Avenger of Blood, Cities of Red, what are these things? So you're going to want to search this out and understand these as you study the Word of God. We need to be able to distinguish between the cultures that are referenced, including the cultures of the Babylonians, the Syrians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and obviously the Jews. What was the Roman law regarding scourging and crucifixion? And what was the way in which the Romans paraded those conquered by them. These are just examples to help get you uh, on the track here. And then we want to talk about, thirdly, the need to understand uh, and bridge the whole historical gap. Uh, in addition to the language and culture gap, we also face a historical gap. The various books of the Bible were written in a historical context that is much different than the world today. Many of the nations that are referenced in the Bible don't even exist today. Superpowers of the biblical world are not superpowers at the present world, like Nineveh and Edom and Hittites. Uh, and yet, so much of the Bible centers around these cultures and the world events that surrounded them in their time. So we need to understand the political world and the relationship of the various nations and each other. And we need to understand the economic and religious forces 
that were at play in the time when these books were actually written. And then fourthly, we want to be able to, to uh, bridge this gap concerning the geographical gap. Uh, and this uh, must be bridged uh, in the geographical gap. Uh, the story of the Bible took place in various geographical settings that are totally unfamiliar to the average reader of the Bible. Um, the geography of the Bible varies from large cities like Rome and rural deserts uh, like Sinai Peninsula and from the beginning of a city, Babel, to its full development as a city, Babylon. Uh, so uh, we, we have to be aware of these so we can understand you know, this geographical bearing on the context or the meaning that we are studying in that reference. We need to understand the topography of the land. Uh, <clears throat> we need to understand the plant and animal life of the land. And also we need to understand the climate and the weather, pa weather patterns of the land. We have to understand uh, mountains and rivers and seas as they relate to the context that we're studying. And we need to understand the proximity of one nation to another nation. And so um, these are the kind of things that will help us rightfully uh, uh, understand the, the, the actual meaning that the original author and the Holy Spirit had in mind as they wrote these powerful, powerful words for you and I to base our lives upon. Amen. Uh, so what are some of the tools that can help us to bridge this communication gap? Well, as we dig deeper in the Word of God, it's like digging for jewels, you know. Uh, gems are rarely found lying on the surface of the ground, and fortunately, others have done a whole lot for us. Now we have, uh, we, when I first started the ministry 41 years ago, man, you had a huge concordance, and you had all kinds of commentaries, and all kinds of books, and, and I mean, it was just, everything was manual labor. And now uh, we have these, these divine, wonderful computer programs like Logos, and uh, eSword and these different ones like this and uh, I recommend to you if you don't have one eSword it's e-sword.net and you basically you can get everything you need from them for free I mean they ask for a donation but they don't require it uh, and then any additional uh, resources or translations that they didn't give you that you might have a, a fancy to uh, you can buy them through them and they're much cheaper and I mean we're talking NIV maybe uh, I'm just taking a guess here, maybe 15 bucks, Amplified 25, in other words, and it, then it's, it's yours on your computer. They are easy to work with, they're, they're, they're huge, and, and, and yet they're simple. Uh, Logos is more complicated, difficult, and it is very expensive, but it is good. Uh, when I worked on my master's degree many, many years ago, uh, I was required as part of my um, <clears throat> program to buy Logos, and of course I had to use it because that was the program they wanted us to use. Uh, working on my master's um, courses and degree, uh, but and I still have that program, but I never use it because uh, it's just laborious. I mean, it's you, you got well, I, I don't. They're a great company, have a great product, but uh, you if you're busy, you, you you may not have the time to learn the program to do it. So, and besides that, it's very expensive. But again, I recommend to you e sword dot net. Take a look at that. Amen. So, what, but what about a concordance? A concordance is a compilation of all the places a certain word occurs in the Bible. Uh, there are modern language concordances, as well as concordances for the original language and uh, text of the Bible. There are exhaustive concordances and complete concordances. Uh, there are concordances that are specific to specific versions of the Bible. Uh, and concordance can be used to find a passage when you know some specific words uh, in the passage for which you're looking, and it's best to try to find the least used word in the context. Uh, again, I say to you, you can do this with a click on the computer, uh, and all these resources are there. A concordance can be used to find all the places where a certain word occurs. If you're using modern language concordance, it will tell you all the places where the modern word occurs. If you're using original language like Greek or Hebrew, uh, it'll tell you where the all the places uh, where that original language word occurred. So it's very beneficial, very helpful as you dig in and you get deep uh, studying the Word of God. Lexicons is another one. Uh, lexicons are dictionaries of words that help you to understand the meaning and the origins of the words as they are used in the original languages. Many lexicons require a certain amount of familiarity with Greek or Hebrew. However, most lexicons 
have a numbering system where you can easily locate the words that you're trying to search. Uh, Bible dictionaries or encyclopedias. These are uh, wonderful resources for background information and summaries of biblical material. Uh, unfortunately, the Bible is not uh, cataloged alphabetically, so people, places, doctors, all of the information is scattered throughout its pages, and these books function just like other dictionaries and encyclopedias, except they focus on topics that are specifically related to the Bible, so they can simplify getting an understanding in some of these areas. Bible handbooks are books that are meant to be read along with your personal Bible reading. Uh, they often give insights into a variety of things, including archaeological findings, relevant historical data, background to the book, and many other useful bits of information. Their weaknesses is that usually they are not large books, and they can't do full justice to any of the areas that they attempt to cover. I mean, they're there, and you get what you get, and so there it is. Uh, Bible atlases are just simply what it sounds like. They're books of maps, and they help you understand many things about the geographical world during Bible times. Um, <clears throat> and you can father, follow, uh, you know, men of God, Jesus, Paul, their, their journeys, and things like that on these maps. Commentaries are written by scholars who try to expand a person's understanding concerning what it's of the books of the Bible. The commentary sets. Uh, can consist of one volume to 66 volumes. Commentaries can be affected greatly by the theology of the person who's doing the writing, and most commentaries can be very helpful since they draw from many sources and bring information together for the purpose of unfolding specific passages of Scripture. I always recommend that you read the Scripture through a couple times, um, the entire book, and then if you're in a specific specific chapter, read that chapter through a time or two, and then uh, spend some time meditating on the actual passage and verses you're looking at, and then write down what you feel God's saying to you that the meaning here is before you go to commentaries. Let commentaries sort of um, <clears throat> uh, support and reinforce what uh, you have already heard the Spirit say to you. Amen. So, um, what about manners and customs of the Bible? These are great resources as well, and uh, uh, they will help you greatly too. Amen. So, um, uh, there are a lot of good books that will help you uh, as a student of the Word to discover a lot of the different cultures and manners and things in that nature. So, uh, take them, use them wisely. Uh, realize that uh, any type of resources that are not directly taken from the Scripture may uh, and likely do express some of the theological slant of the author of the book. It also may involve uh, some of their own, um, how shall I say, conjecture at times. Uh, but I believe as a whole, most of them try to be on, on point and correct as they can, at least as they see the scripture. So uh, anyway, uh, it should be remembered, however, that all these books, as good as they are, are not to be placed on the same authority as the Bible. They are all written by human authors and are therefore subject to misinterpretation. And I think that any time you come across a resource book, that even in your spirit you feel a check, or particularly if you see something that blatantly and clearly uh, contradicts what you know the Bible to say clearly, then that is a situation where you want to put it down, and uh, you know, and and really consider whether this is one that you want to be using, um, because you don't want to taint your knowledge or understanding of what the Bible actually says. Don't let man try to tell you that God has changed his mind or that or that. Uh, uh, the Bible does not mean today what it says. The Bible never changes. It's, it's, it's based on God's character, and we know that God's character is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, yes, methods and things that we might use to reach people and to, uh, you know, a function in ministry may change because they don't violate the character of God. They don't violate the character of Scripture. But Scripture is forever settled in heaven. The psalm says that the word has been tried seven times and found pure. You don't need to fix the word. Anybody that tries to fix the word uh, needs fixing, okay? So let's just be careful we don't get trapped into something there. Uh, then we go ahead and we can uh, discuss also the, the need for understanding, you know, uh, grammars um, and things of that nature, the cultural gap. We talked about that. These are just some books 
and things that we're recommending to you that you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, research and use to benefit you in your study. Uh, we've got Bible dictionaries here, biblical interpretation, geographical gap, the historical gap, a lot of wonderful suggestions that you might look into. But again, I highly recommend for your computer study, just just get the uh, e, esword.net. Uh, and, and use that too, amen. So let's go on to number 12 and, and uh, wrap this class up, this course up. So what are some of the things that will help to lay a foundation for deeper biblical study? Well, uh, before you can understand the parts of the Bible, you need to have a good handle on the whole Bible. And as you approach uh, the idea of deeper Bible study, there are some important foundations to lay in your own experience uh, of the Bible. <clears throat> so, um, uh, first of all, you want to have a general working knowledge of the Bible as a whole. So, the first thing you want to do is read the Bible and uh, just get familiar with it. Just get to know it. Amen. And then you want an understanding of the chronology and the main events of the Bible. You want to understand that even though Job is somewhat uh, a third of the way into the Bible, it, it's an older book. Uh, maybe the very oldest book. Um, and so you want to understand some things like that. You want to understand the basic themes of the Bible. And you want to understand the basic doctrines of the Bible. Also, um, we need to ask the question, what are some of the principles of interpretation that will help us to rightly divide the Word of God? Uh, so we'll be going into that later on in principles of interpretation in, in, in our hermeneutics course, if you go there, or if you choose to do that or if you've been assigned that already. So, <clears throat> but first of all, let's just breeze over these, give you, kind of whet your appetite for deeper study and proper uh, uh, hermeneutics. Uh, so you want to let the scripture interpret scripture, okay? Acts 17, 11 says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So talk about the Bereans here. Uh, this group of individuals, uh, man, they were hungry for the word. They received the word readily. They didn't fight the word. They didn't resist the word. Um, but at the same time, they went home and they dug into it to make sure what they were being taught was truly from the Bible and the word. Uh, so what you might ask questions. What else does the Bible say about this subject? So by studying cross-references, you can find out what the rest of the Bible says on the subject. Uh, you don't approach a verse with the intent of proving a doctrine, but rather you approach the verse in an attempt to understand the doctrine, okay? Um, there have been far smarter people than me and you that have, have uh, been studying this Bible and left great resources and things of that nature, but the Bible wasn't written to, um, for us to question or for us to prove. The Bible was written for us to study and for us to believe, amen. So uh, pay careful attention to the context of the verse. A text out of context is what we call a pretext, okay? So often you hear people quote a verse, for example, found in Romans 8, 28, when something negative happens, they'll say, well, you know what the Bible says, all things to work together for good. But the Bible does indeed say this, but if you read the rest of the verse, it finishes this very important phrase by saying this, to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Now, it takes on a whole different meaning, don't it? So we don't take anything out of context. And when we say that, we don't only mean parts of verses, we also mean verses out of chapters or passages. In other words, what you want to do is you want to interpret a phrase within the actual verse that it's in, within the actual chapter that it's in, within the actual book that it's in, within the actual Bible that it's in. Amen? And you don't separate those from one another. So pay careful attention to that context. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So discovering the context includes attention to some specific areas. Old or New Testament. Okay. Uh, the book of the Bible. The chapter of the book. What comes before. What comes after. The central subject being discussed. That's basically what I just said. Look for specific things that will bring out the meaning. Um, so... Uh, uh, you want to um, specifically uh, understand what God's author and the Holy Spirit really had in mind 
when they said whatever it was they said. Watch for repetition of words. Look for words and phrases that repeat. Look for key words that will help you understand the main thrust of the passage. Look for contrast, ideas, individuals, items that are contrasted with each other. Uh, and, 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 and give it an opportunity to you know, to fully round out the meaning and the, and the understanding. Look for comparisons. Uh, look for lists. Uh, note where the text mentions more than two items. Uh, look for cause and effect. Look for the cause for certain effects and for the effects brought on by various causes. There may be more than one effect from a single cause mentioned in the text. Look for conjunctions. Note items that are that join units, including uh, typical conjunctions like but and and, for. Look for verbs. Determine the action involved and whether a verb is active or passive. And pay special attention to imperatives. Look for pronouns and be sure to identify the proper uh, incident for each pronoun. Look at the tone of the author. Is the author giving an admonition an exhortation, a warning, a promise, an encouragement, or a judgment. And then, of course, look for questions. The Word of God poses many through provoking uh, many poses many thoughts, thought-provoking questions. Excuse me. As we meditate on the question, we better understand what is being uh, intended in the text. We know Jesus was the great question-answering teacher. Uh, he asked questions many times. And we know uh, as educators that asking questions is a powerful way to engage students. Amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 33, uh, 1, 13. My mind's wandering off on me here. Uh, in, is Christ divided, the scripture says. This is Paul speaking. Was Paul crucified for you, he says. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? In other words, you're just asking questions here. That will get people thinking, all right? So look for divine principles and apply to any age, any people, anywhere. And then the last question I believe we want to look at here is uh, what are some practical guidelines to ensure that you get the most from, this, from your Bible study? Uh, <clears throat> you want to always start uh, a study project with prayer. Ask God to help to open up the passage to you to give you understanding and to speak his intended message for you. Read the passage several times. Uh, read it in several translations to get different perspectives. Establish the boundaries of the passage. Determine which verses before the passage and after it are necessary to understand it. Research the background material relating to the passage. And then uh, ask these questions. Who is the author of the passage? To whom was the passage written? And when was the passage written? Then you want to discover the context, content of the passage. So uh, you do this by asking what are the key or repeated words of the passage? Are any unique words used in this passage? Who's speaking? Who's being spoken to? Are there any cultural, ceremonial, geographic, or historical issues in the passage? What persons are mentioned? What places are mentioned? What events are mentioned? What objects are mentioned? What symbols are used? Does the author give any advice to the readers in this passage? Uh, are any contrast or comparisons made in the passage? Are any lists given? Are there any summary statements given in the passage? And what is the author's tone of the passage? Then you evaluate your passage by examining and asking what is the purpose of this passage, what's the main point, uh, how does it relate to the rest of the book that it's in, how does the passage relate to the other books of the Testament, uh, and then how does the passage relate to the Bible uh, as a whole. And so as we're asking these questions, what we're doing is we're rounding out our understanding of the Word. Remember that in our personal relationship with Christ, We've got to spend time in prayer. We've got to spend time speaking to God and hearing from God. And then we've got to let His Word become His voice and His sustenance for our life. God bless you and thank you for taking this course.